Hello, I'm Joan Howe with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So, you've decided to participate in the Junior Duck Stamp Program. That's great! To make the best project possible, you need to know your subjects well. So, we're going to spend a little time here getting to know waterfowl. So, remember, what is waterfowl? It's ducks, geese, and swans. Now, there are other water birds uh, like herons and egrets, grebes and loons, but those are not waterfowl. We're talking about ducks. You can actually divide them into two different broad categories. There is the dabbling ducks and there is the diving ducks. Dabbling ducks, you know by their behavior because their head will be underwater and their tails will be up in the air and they are actually feeding on different plants uh, and, and other organisms underneath the water. But they also walk very well on, on the land and sometimes will graze uh, on, on the plants on dry land as well. Uh, diving ducks will dive completely under the water to get their food. They may be eating plants, they may be eating mollusks or fish underneath the water. Sometimes we'll dive to great distances. Some ducks that'll go down to 800 feet. And they're great swimmers, but they are not great walkers on land. They are very ungainly when they try to walk. Their feet are much adapted to swimming under the water. Sometimes they'll use their feet as paddles and sometimes they'll use their wings to swim underwater. Now, one of the characteristics of diving ducks is that they often have black and white on them. They aren't exactly sure why. Maybe the fact that they blend in with the waves when the predators are looking at them from the air, but many of them, you'll notice, have black and white on them. So, it's pretty easy by looking at their behaviors, the difference between dabbling ducks and diving ducks. So, we're going to take the dabbling ducks first. And there's a lot of ducks in that category, so we're going to start from there first. And the most common one that we are going to talk about is the mallard duck. This is a male mallard duck. Male ducks are called drakes. So this is a drake mallard. And you can tell that the green head um, and the little curl to the, to the tail is some of the identifying characteristics uh, to this duck. But only the male mallard duck, the drake, has that curl to the tail there. So remember that. You can look at a silhouette of a duck and actually be able to identify a duck. And maybe you're not close enough to the duck to be able to see the colors on it. You can tell it from the size and the shape. So here is a silhouette of a drake mallard duck. Can you see? That same shape and the curl that on the tail there, that is a drake mallard duck. Now, see if you can pick out the drake mallard duck. Do you see it? It's right there. So, we are going to move on to another uh, dabbling duck. This one is named for what it actually looks like. This is called the northern pintail. Can you see the long skinny pintails uh, on this duck? It's a long-necked, graceful looking duck. Uh, very beautiful, uh, dabbling duck. And as it flies in the air, you can actually see that silhouette. Can you tell the difference between that and the mallard? Sure you can. Now, let's pick it out from a group of silhouettes. Can you tell which one is the northern pintail? That's it. That's right. That's the one. Now, there is one more very beautiful dabbling duck that we're going to talk about today, and that is the wood duck. Now, the wood duck is a unique duck. Most of the time, the ducks will nest on, a, on the ground, on a ground nest, but this duck does something different to be able to survive. It puts its nest up in a hole in a cavity of a tree, uh, and that's where it raises its babies, and so that's why it's called a wood duck, because you can usually find it in the woods there. But look how 
beautiful colored this duck is. It's, it's often one that a lot of junior duck stamp students will pick to draw because of the many colors on this duck. Now, let's look at a silhouette of a wood duck. Notice that it has kind of a tuft to the back side of its head, and that's often a very identifying characteristic of a wood duck. So now let's see if we can't pick out a wood duck from the other silhouettes on the page. All right, good job. You picked it out. So there are many other dabbling ducks. Uh, we've just picked out a few uh, for you to learn here, but we better move over to the diving ducks, like this ring neck duck. Now on the neck, you will see a little brown ring. Uh, that's why it's called a ring neck duck, but it's really hard to see unless you're close. Mostly what you're going to see is a um, ring on the bill of the duck. Now one duck that has a very specialized bill for eating fish is called a merganser. And this is a hooded merganser. And you can see the very fine serrations along the edge of the bill help hold on to the fish. Now this hooded merganser has some feathers that it will lift up as a hood, which is sort of a way of attracting the females. Um, but it'll also put that hood down, so sometimes you will see it flying with its hood down. It also is one that nests in the cavity of a tree, just like the wood duck. There is also a very colorful, beautiful bufflehead duck here. I have the male and I have the female here. The females will often be more drab and not as colorful as the, the males. The female is called a Susie. And the Susies have to sit on the nest uh, with the eggs, sometimes very vulnerable. And so often the female bird is much less colorful than the male bird because of that vulnerability to predators while they're on the nest. When you are looking at it from uh, far away, the, the drake buffleheads really look like a very white uh, from a distance. You'll see a lot of white and they uh, they dive down and they just bob right back up to the top there. They're almost like a fluff of cotton that just can't stay under. So we have the dabbling ducks and we have the diving ducks, but let's move over to the geese. The Canada goose. That is probably the most common goose that many people recognize. Um, you notice the body shape and form of the Canada goose uh, is quite different than, than the ducks. They also have very strong legs and feet. Geese often are browsers. That means they walk around and they eat the plants uh, on, the, uh, on the ground there. And um, they will eat other uh, things uh, as well, but mostly they will eat plants in the, in the dry ground. So Canada goose is very characteristic. It's black and white uh, here. And the male and the females of the Canada goose look exactly the like. We call that sex is similar. Now there is another goose that is fairly common in this area. It is a white fronted goose. The hunters call them speckle bellies, but the name of it is the greater white fronted goose. And it is um, more brown. It had, does have a speckled belly uh, on it. Uh, and its, its tail is almost like a, um, a part of a bullseye that's cut out. It's, it's striped. And then there is a very characteristic uh, goose called the snow goose. And if you can imagine the color of snow, which is white, these geese are white with black tipped wings. They often occur in huge flocks um, and, and mass together. And so often when you see one snow geese, you see a thousand snow geese. And uh, the interesting thing about snow geese is they have what's called the blue phase, which is a genetic anomaly. And so every now and then one of the geese would be blue, but it's still a snow geese. So the last category of waterfowl is the swans. Now, there are two native swans in North America, the tundra swan and the trumpeter swan. Uh, there is a mute swan, which is a, um, 
domestic swine, and you'll know mute swans immediately because it has a bright orange bill. All the native swans have black bills. So if you're doing a swan, make sure you draw a black bill. But they are very large birds. Uh, their wingspan can get up to seven and a half feet uh, in, in length. They are very heavy bodied bird and they like really cold temperatures. So they often are in the places where, where the uh, winter temperatures are very cold. That's just a few of the many waterfowl that you can pick from. There are uh, dozens of ducks, dozens of geese, uh, and two swans. So take a look at some of the identification as you pick out your favorite bird to be able to draw for your duck stamp. So now that we've learned some of our waterfowl, let's go look at the habitats where they live. So, we are going to go to a place called Tennessee National Wildlife Refuge to look at where the birds are hanging out. First, let's talk about wetlands, which are wet areas that could either be fresh water, it could be brackish water, which means a combination of fresh water and salt water, or it could be a swamp, which is uh, the water underneath a bunch of trees. The birds will also hang out in fields, it can be an open, dry field or a flooded up field. Sometimes these are actually agriculture crops such as wheat or corn uh, for these fields. There are open water areas. Certainly waterfowl need water and so it could be shallow water or deep water open areas. Sometimes they just hang out and just rest on these. Sometimes they're feeding in these areas. There is also what we call shrub scrub areas and these are usually flooded up shrubby uh, rough looking areas. This is where the ducks will go to find their mates. Uh, they will um, uh, feed in there, but it also provides good cover uh, from any kind of predators or anybody disturbing them while they are uh, selecting their mates. There is a flooded forest called Green Tree Reservoirs, and these areas often have lots of food supplies like acorns. Did you know ducks actually eat acorns and other seeds drop from trees and are very uh, high protein areas for them to feed? And of course, there are plenty of ducks that live in the ocean or along the shores of oceans where there is plentiful food supplies for them. There are mud flats these areas look terrible to us. They don't look very pretty, but they are very important to a lot of ducks, like widgeons and other ducks that feed along there. And you know what they're eating? They're eating a lot of the little bugs and the worms and the, we call them macroinvertebrates that um, are in the mud and they're probing in the mud to get them. And those bugs are actually high in protein. Did you know oftentimes waterfowl won't eat the same thing? They'll change up their diet just like you do for different things that they need. And right before breeding season, they are needing high protein. And oftentimes they'll switch over to places like mud flats to eat the macroinvertebrates that are high in protein. So now that we've seen some of the habitats where they live, let's talk a little bit about the conservation of those habitats. As you can see how important it is that the ducks have these habitats to be able to survive. No habitats means no waterfowl. So conserving and protecting those areas sometimes means that places are set aside. You don't build houses there. You don't build buildings there. You maybe don't even go in there. Maybe it's just a place set aside for just the waterfowl to have peace and quiet and places for them to feed, find their mates, and raise their babies. So that's often what National Wildlife Refuges provide, these safe places for waterfowl and many other wildlife to be able to live and thrive and have access to places that maybe they're not disturbed quite so often. Pretty important, huh? 
So how do we get places like National Wildlife Refuges and other public lands? Remember the duck stamp? Remember how the waterfowl hunters actually bought duck stamps to be able to help and buy those lands? Well, guess what? I'm not a duck hunter. I'm a birder, which means I look at birds and I buy duck stamps too. Every time you buy a duck stamp, you are helping out waterfowl. And guess what? Just by participating in the Junior Duck Stamp Program, you are also conserving and protecting waterfowl. Now that you have a little background on your subjects, it's time to pick the species that you will draw for your Junior Duck Stamp Art Project. Remember, we only covered a few of them today. There is a long list of native North American species and other contest information that you can find on this website. We look so forward to seeing your art project and thank you for caring enough to participate in the Junior Duck Stamp Program.